happy to be here today uh, to spread some uh, wildflower joy um, for everybody. Uh, so I'll, I have a lot of information in this presentation because I really did want to provide enough um, that you could go and apply these methods and grow a native plant garden. Um, and I'm so glad this is being recorded just because I do realize it is a lot of information and I'll just try and touch on some of the highlights as I go through. Um, I am volunteering for the Alberta Native Plant Council, um, and usually I am an ecologist. I usually work for uh, Ducks Unlimited Canada, um, and then this is just a volunteer gig for me, but I am passionate about um, Alberta's flora, and um, it's particularly about, um, you know, promoting the use of, of native plant species and the conservation of native habitats. So the Alberta Native Plant Council is a not-for-profit um, incorporated in 1988. Um, so we've been around for a while. Um, we're volunteer driven um, and native plants are at the core of what we do. So our members often work in conservation or in the environmental field um, or the horticulture industry and just volunteer on the side for our, our organization. Um, and among our primary objectives are educating um, you know, the public about uh, what native plants are, why we should conserve their habitats, and then to, to actually um, develop specific conservation actions to conserve native plants in Alberta. That being said, what is a native plant? So uh, native plant species are those that occur naturally in Alberta and they were here long before European settlers were here. So they've been here for, um, in some cases, probably hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and certainly since the last glaciation, which was 10,000 years ago. Um, so the reason that they uh, are important from our perspective is that they are the most adapted species to our climate, to um, our geology, and to the various habitats that you'll find in the province. And I've included some interesting species along the top here. So the one on the left is ghost pipe. This is a, a parasitic plant species that you find sort of everywhere across the province. Um, this one I found out at uh, Clifford E. Lee Nature Sanctuary outside of Edmonton. Uh, the second one is uh, water smartweed. Kristen, we've just lo lost your audio. It looks like you're frozen there. Um, are, is everybody else still able to hear me? Is it just Kristen that we've lost for a second? Yeah. I can still hear you. I was wondering if it was on my end. Okay. Okay. No, it looks like there might be uh, just some technical difficulties. I'm sure Kristen will rejoin us again in a second, but that's really cool. I had no idea that we had parasitic plants like that um, in Alberta. So uh, I... I'm going to keep an eye out now when I'm out and about and see if I can find any parasitic plants. I'm curious, I know there's a few other groups who have just been able to join us, so welcome. Uh, we just lost the connection with Kristen, but I'm sure she'll rejoin as soon as she can. So she's joining us with the Alberta Native Plant Council and uh, she had mentioned that she usually works for Ducks Unlimited, she's an ecologist and it's actually a volunteer position with Alberta Native Plant Council. So we're really fortunate to have her come in and give a webinar like this because personally, I don't know very much about gardening. I like to put seeds in the ground and see what happens. But um, apart from that, I think that Kristen's the real expert here. So hopefully she's able to join uh, momentarily again. <laughs> Um, in the meantime, I know, I think we have participants from Fort McMurray, from, uh, uh, from Calgary, I believe, and from New Myrnum School, and I apologize because I'm probably still pronouncing the name of your town wrong. Uh, is everybody doing a, like an at-home garden? I know lots of people are muted. Feel free, you can use the reaction buttons if you want, or uh, or you can unmute yourselves and you should be able to, to speak that way too. We are planning to make a garden at our school, but our 
plans are on hold right now since everyone has to be learning at home. Of course, yeah. yeah. We, we are looking at uh, doing a hydroponic system at uh, Hillhurst School. Um, and they're just working through the budget and going through what they can afford and what they can't afford. And uh, hopefully we should be done all that by when we come back, hopefully after May long, and then we'll be able to get going with that. Awesome. Cool. There's such a great variety of projects. Um, Kristen, sorry, we lost you there for a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. Um, you should be able to share your screen again, um, and then you can just pick right up where you left off. Yes, my apologies. My son unplugged my internet <laughs> router. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Um, yes, um, we'll get right back into it. <laughs> love it. Okay, so why do we value native plant species? Um, I was just, I, I'm not sure how much you missed, but I'll just pick it right back up. So I think in particular, I want to highlight how important some of these species are for wildlife, for pollinators, and then also for people. Um, so all of the species that I'm showing in this slide are um, important food or medicine sources for our Indigenous peoples. So on the left, you can see, um, I was actually fortunate enough to work with an elder uh, digging up uh, what this species is called rat root, um, and it's an important species for treating um, stomach aches, and it grows in boreal environments in wetlands. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to spend a couple days uh, with some elders, uh, and we harvested some of the species together. Um, the second uh, picture is also rat root. That's just its flowering structure. The third one is wild mint. I caught a little bit when I just came back on talking about working with hydroponics. Um, and I thought I would just chime in that this is a great species that you might grow in that sort of situation. I have my own indoor uh, hydroponic herb garden and I grow mint in it. Um, and then the last species is Labrador tea. So these are all wetland species found in the boreal forest and they're all native to Alberta. Okay, uh, so I think, you know, I've kind of hit this a few times now, but I'll just reiterate one more time. Why would, why would we encourage growing native plants? Well, they're, they're the most adapted species to where we live, so they're going to grow really well. Um, once they're established, you, you're not going to have to give them supplemental water or fertilizers. Um, they, they already are well adapted to, to growing without those kinds of um, supplemental measures. Uh, and then just more widely in our in our urban environments, you know, our, our houses and our lawns are often dominated by just one species of grass. And there's not a lot of habitat for wildlife for pollinators. So by introducing just small plots of native plants to our gardens, we can create this habitat. Um, we can grow edible berries. Um, to provide local food security, or we can just enjoy the beauty of these native plants um, in our urban environments as well. So I wanted to touch a little bit more on pollinators. Um, you know, some of the notes I have coming up in these slides talk about the ways that pollinators use native plants. So they could either be um, host plants that are used by butterflies and moths to lay eggs on. So all of the pictures here are showing um, milkweed, which is the host plant for monarch butterflies. And you can see the monarch butterfly in that top right photo and the monarch caterpillar in the left photo. So the milkweed is a host plant for the monarch butterfly. And of course, this is a species of special concern in Canada. Um, and it's, it's a great idea to grow milkweeds to increase the monarch's habitat. There's also nectar plants, which are a food source for bees, butterflies, and moth. And then these pollinators also um, will eat the pollen of our native plant species. And 87% of our native plant species in Alberta um, are pollinated by wildlife species. So the bees, the butterflies, the birds. And then just to hone in a little bit more on one particular pollinator, the native bees. I just, uh, I think this is really fascinating. So, um, cause a lot of people don't realize how many bees we have. So North America has over 4,000 species of native bees. In Alberta, we have 321 known species. And I really highlight known because there are probably so many more that we just haven't discovered yet. 
And of these, you know, we have our bumblebees. So those are sort of our colony forming species and, and the classic bee that you would think of. That picture on the yellow flower on the left is a bumblebee. Um, and then we also have solitary bees. So these are the ones that don't form big colonies, but just kind of spend their lives um, solitary or alone. Um, so they can be leaf cutter, mason bees, mining bees, plaster bees, or sweat bees. And um, here's where we talk about the importance of a messy garden. So solitary bees either nest in hollow stems or in the ground. So it is really important in the fall that you leave your garden messy, that you leave those hollow stems and that bare soil available for these native bee species to overwinter in. And then there are, uh, of course, non-native bee species as well. And, and the most famous is the European honeybee, which is that photo on the top right. Um, and honeybees are important, don't get me wrong. Uh, so 41% of Canada's honeybee colonies are in Alberta, and that's because they pollinate all of our canola crops and other crops. Um, so they are an important species, they're just not a native species. So if you're thinking about conservation of bees, think about, you know, not only the honeybee, but those 321 other species that we have and their unique habitat requirements. And then if you're interested in bees, I would encourage you to check out the Alberta Native Bee Council. Okay, so let's get into growing native plant gardens. Um, so I, I wanted to really encourage you uh, with these photos that, you know, you don't need a big space. You can, you can do this in containers, um, in small yard spaces. Uh, you know, especially if you're just getting started, it might actually be better if you start with a small space and just kind of experiment a little with different seeds, different species. Um, definitely consider uh, what the climate and soil and light conditions are where you live or where you're planning to put your garden. And I'll get into what some of the ideal conditions are in a little bit more detail. Um, but I do know that, you know, we have students from across Alberta. So in, for example, um, I'll present some plants later on that are more adapted to drier areas like Calgary, and then some plants that are more adapted to, you know, wetter, colder regions like where I am in Edmonton or even further north up to Fort McMurray, for example. You want to think about what the purpose of your garden is. So, you know, there's a lot of native species, but you wouldn't plant stinging nettle, even though it is native and it is a pollinator species, you wouldn't plant it because it would be a little more hazardous for kids or pets. Um, and you might, you, the one thing that I should also mention is you need a lot of patience when you're trying to grow native plants because establishing them can be um, a longer term project. Once they're established, they're, they're really resilient, but it does take a little bit to get them growing, especially from seed. So when you're starting out, I would recommend that you start small. Um, you know, you're gonna have to do a lot of maintenance in the first year until your, your flowers are established. Um, if you're taking out lawn grass and planting species where lawn grass used to be, you're probably gonna be dealing with a lot of um, weeding out really um, annoying quack grass, uh, for example, from your beds. Um, you might wanna consider, because native garden beds often look a little messier than people are used to, you might want to consider adding signage or a nice little fence or stepping stones or other um, measures that would define the garden and, and indicate that it, it is meant to be pollinator habitat so your neighbors kind of understand what you're what you're doing. Um, and then when you're planting for pollinators, you want to plant species that have um, bloom periods all the way from the spring to the fall so that there's always a flowering species in your garden. And I will talk about some of the species that I would recommend. When you're growing from seed, this is um, one of the trickiest ways to establish your garden, but it is also one of the most accessible or one of the um, least expensive ways to, to go. So I will provide these recommendations and then we'll we'll talk about maybe some of the easier ways to start in a second. But when you're starting from seed, um, you do need to do what is called stratification a lot of the time. And that's because our native plant species are used to overwintering in minus 30 temperatures. And so in order for them to understand that it's spring and they, they should start growing, they often need to experience that cold shock first. So 
um, by stratifying them, what you're doing is you're just putting them in the fridge for um, at least six weeks. And then when you take them out and plant them, they'll be like, oh, yay, it's spring. And, and they'll be more likely to germinate. <laughs> Often before you put them in the fridge, you might just moisten them um, using, for example, a moist cotton ball or um, a moist sand mixture. Um, and that way you might have more success with germination. Um, some seeds also require what's called scarification, where you have to actually break the seed coat in order for them to germinate. Um, I will not be recommending any species that require that process today because it is a little bit more intense. Um, but the idea is that you're actually mimicking the digestive process of, an, of a, a wildlife species who would eat the berry, digest the seed, and then the seed would grow. So when you are growing from seed, um, I would recommend that you start in containers and that you start indoors if possible. Um, you can use potting soil, but it's actually recommended in a lot of cases to use just the soil from your garden. Um, and that's because the plants um, will be a little hardier if they um, start their lives in your garden soil versus if they are started out in this, you know, sort of, uh, a natural soil mixture and then transfer it into your garden soil later, they get a little bit of a shock from that. Um, you, you probably wanna sow your seeds sparsely so that you can separate them later and you wanna sow them really shallow. So like no more than a centimeter deep um, or no more than twice the depth of the size of the seed you're planting. And then if you're indoors um, and you have you know, fluorescent lighting and, and that kind of setup, that's great. If not, just try and keep the containers warm and moist, water them every day, offer as much light as possible and protect them from the wind. Um, and then be patient. Germination may take several months when you're first starting out. Um, and as soon as they germinate, you can transplant them to your garden, into the actual garden plots. Uh, a couple other recommendations I have here are applying mulch around your freshly planted seeds just for weed control and just keep watering them. So at least um, while they're in their containers, you wanna water them probably every day. And then once they're transplanted, continue to water them every day for probably about six weeks before they'll um, be really established and be able to continue on their own. Um, if you do not have the time or the equipment to plant into containers, you can also just direct seed into your garden bed. Um, I would recommend planting right now if you're, if you're hoping to do this. Um, if you have not stratified your seeds, you might wait until the fall. And then if you plant in the fall, the seeds will overwinter in your garden and break dormancy next spring, um, just naturally. Um, if you're choosing uh, your garden plot location, you probably want somewhere that has at least six hours of sunlight. And again, you wanna sow your seeds really shallow, no more than twice the depth of the size of the seed or about one centimeter. The seeds are usually fairly small. Uh, yeah, another recommendation that I thought was a good one if you're direct seeding to your garden is you might designate certain areas to be certain species and have a map of where you plant everything because then you know when you're weeding what is a weed and what isn't. Uh, and then yeah, make sure that you have you know a schedule or really great commitments from your volunteers to, to keep on top of that maintenance when your species are just establishing so that weeds don't take over. And water every day for probably the first six weeks at least until your, your native plants establish. Okay. Um, oh, we have a question that's coming sure. too. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, no, uh, we're wondering, is it too late this year to start seeds indoors? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that um, one thing I haven't touched on, and I think it might be in this slide, or maybe I just forgot to mention it. Oh, no, it's in this slide. Um, so no matter when you start with the native plants, um, don't expect them to flower in the first year. So they're probably gonna use the first year to establish really great roots and build up their reserves. And they probably won't flower until the second year. So for that reason, I don't think it's too late. 
because you could even plant, um, you could start your containers and you could transplant them in July. And they'll, you know, they'll just get those roots established um, for the remaining growing season. And then next year, your garden will take off. Um, that being said, uh, if you are starting this year, my recommendation is, um, especially if your budget allows for it and if you have a good supplier, which I will talk about recommended suppliers in a minute, um, is that you buy and transplant plugs. So these are um, greenhouse bought um, seedlings that some of the grower has already gone through the efforts of germinating the seedlings and um, you can just transplant them directly into your garden. So it takes a lot of the uncertainty out of growing from seeds out of the equation. And certainly um, I plan to do some gardening this year with native plants and my plan is to buy plugs. <laughs> uh, so I would recommend this. Um, it will yield the most success there's a good chance um, that if you um, buy from a grower, you, you might get uh, more success in um, flowering in the first year, potentially, if you use plugs. Uh, but regardless, I, it'll, just, it'll just yield quicker results for you. So that being said, um, I'm gonna shift gears and show some of the species that um, I would recommend that are adapted to Alberta um, and are easy to grow here, uh, but also important in that they have a range of blooming times and uh, they'll tolerate a range of uh, moisture conditions, that kind of thing. So these are the species that you might go and ask uh, a local greenhouse if they have them available. So my first one is early blue violet. This species is flowering right now in our native forests um, and grasslands. So it's the first, it's almost the first thing probably after the crocuses to uh, flower in the spring. Um, it's just a small little ground cover. Uh, it likes dry to moist conditions and it's great for bees and for caterpillars. Um, one of the recommendations I saw about it is that it works really well in rock gardens. So um, often in places like Calgary that can be quite dry, um, you'll see people who do what's called zero scaping. Um, so just really low moisture um, conditions uh, that you're gardening in and, and this species would do well in that kind of situation. I also found that it's a host for the fertility butterflies. I didn't have a picture of those, unfortunately, but that was really cool to know. And this species, the seed benefits from stratification, but it's not required. Um, so if you don't have time, you could still give it a go and plant it right now and see what happens. Another great uh, low-lying ground cover is uh, pink pussy toast. I didn't have a picture of the flower, but it's a beautiful little pink flower. But perhaps even more um, notable about this plant is that it, the plant itself is, is quite gorgeous. With its silvery leaves, it forms a nice matte ground cover, so it'll cover your space really well. It also likes dry to moist conditions and flowers in the spring. So that's another good one for right now. Um, this is one of the really showy plants. Um, this, th this picture doesn't do the flower justice, um, but it's just a beautiful um, purple blue flower. It's quite a bit taller. Um, it likes moist to damp sites. So I put rain gardens here because uh, that's kind of um, something that's becoming more fashionable right now is to create these uh, water loving areas of our garden where you might let your eaves trough out and the, the garden space will accumulate and infiltrate water. So you might plant this species in that kind of situation. It's a great species for our native bees, our honeybees and our and sphinx moths. And um, although the seeds benefit from stratification, again, it's not required if you don't have the time to do it this year. Uh, this one is one of my favorite. It's uh, three flowered avens, or it's also known as prairie smoke because of that um, really neat seed head that you can see at the bottom of the screen. Um, this one I actually do have in my garden right now. I think it came in on its own, which is just kind of interesting. Um, and now it's starting to spread slowly, which is great. Uh, it also likes moist to damp uh, conditions. And um, 
Again, it doesn't require stratification, so it's relatively easy to grow from seed. Heart-leaved Alexanders. So again, we're getting a little bit taller, but this is still a spring flowering species. Um, it likes moist to damp conditions again, and it's also great for pollinators. With this one, stratification is required to germinate the seeds. So your best bet is to plant it from a seedling or a plug if you just purchase it from your, your local supplier. Um, nodding onion. This one is a great example of an edible species. Um, so as the name implies, it, it's kind of like a chive or an onion um, and you can eat it. Uh, it's also spring flowering and likes dry sites. So again, if you're down in the south, I would recommend this for a drier location. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't require stratification. Stratification helps, but it's not required for this species. Harebell, um, so this isn't a great photo either, um, but this species you might recognize, it's, it's very common across the entire province of Alberta. It grows in a lot of um, our meadow habitats. Uh, and it's also really recognizable because it blooms all the way from June to September. So there's always a flower, which means that it's great for pollinators. Um, it offers that pollinator um, nectar or pollen throughout the entire season. Uh, yeah, and it likes dry to moist sites and stratification is not required. It's helpful, but not required. This one is probably one of the most recognizable native wildflowers in Alberta. Uh, Gallardia, it's called, or blanket flower. It's very common in um, our grasslands, uh, so it likes those dry sites. You would see it sort of um, from Red Deer south in the grasslands. Um, this is a summer flowering species. Um, and it's great for butterflies and bees and all of the pollinating insects. It, it just attracts them with its vivid, vivid colors. And I thought it was also really interesting. Um, goldfinch eat the seeds of the species, so also a pollination species for birds. And it's easy to grow, which is just so wonderful because it's such a beautiful flower. Uh, giant hyssop. Uh, this is a tall species. Um, so in this case, this is the kind of species that you might grow along your back fence line or against your house um, or just at the back of your garden. Um, it's also an edible species. So uh, people make tea from the flowers and leaves of it. I've never tried it personally. Uh, it's summer flowering. It likes dry sites and you don't need to stratify the seeds. So it's fairly easy to grow. Uh, golden aster. This is a prairie plant. So you would find it again down in the south. Um, it likes full sun and dry, dry, dry sites. It's very drought tolerant. So again, you might see it in those um, zero scaped or those rock gardens that you often find in Calgary or, or south. The seeds do not require stratification, so it is fairly easy to grow. Meadow blazing star. So this one is one of my favorites. Um, it's quite common in the area I live, so Edmonton and probably further north from here. It's often found um, sort of at the fringes of uh, wetland habitats. Um, it's medium in height, it likes full sun, and it's very colorful, <laughs> as you can see. And it is a um, pollinator species for so many different pollinators. So I was finding, um, you know, bees, swallowtail, sulfur, and monarch butterflies. Also moths, goldfinches love it. Um, so yeah, it's just a really beneficial but beautiful species to have in your garden. And again, stratification of the seeds is not required. So it's fairly easy to grow. Um, Fleabane. So this is just a nice um, medium height uh, plant. Uh, it's a little bit more adapted to drier conditions um, and it's hardy and, and a lot of the sources I was finding said that it, it is a really easy species to grow, um, which is I think one of the reasons why I was I threw it in here as well. 
uh, wild bergamot, <laughs> this one um, is also known as bee balm, is just absolutely stunning. Um, so it's, it's it's such a great example of uh, what you would expect to see in, in just about any garden. Um, I'm sure if this one uh, was more common in garden centers, people would grow it like crazy. But I think people don't always realize that some of our native wildflowers can be so beautiful. Uh, it likes full sun to semi-shade. Um, it likes damp sites, so you might put it in a wetter corner of your garden or in a rain garden, and it attracts all kinds of pollinators. The bumblebees, the black sweat bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, sphinx moths, and really cool fact about it is that it has edible flowers and they taste like um, oregano or thyme. So you might add it to your um, spaghetti bolognese sauce. <laughs> and it's relatively easy to grow. Stratification of the seeds is not required. Okay, I just have a few more. I'm checking my time. I'll just get through these really quick and we'll, we can have some questions. Um, wild blue flax is actually, I, it's, it's a cultivated species in, in some areas, um, so it's fairly um, common and uh, easy to grow. I, not only is it easy to grow, but when I say it self-seeds, that means that it often spreads really quickly by its own seed. So you might plant one in your garden one year and you'll have five the next year and 20 the next year. Um, it enjoys full sun, dry sites. So again, if you're in Southern Alberta, I would recommend this species. And it also is one of those species that blooms and reblooms all year long. So it provides that constant flower for your pollinators. And stratification of the seeds is not required. Okay, so we're moving um, to late summer flowering species. And again, these are important because the ones that flower um, in August, September, and even still have those flowers into October are really, really important species for bees and butterflies that are going into dormancy. So they're just building up those last reserves of energy and then they're going to go into dormancy for the winter. And I, I found that in particular bumblebee queens um, rely on the goldenrod and the aster, the late flowering aster species um, to go into dormancy. So they are important species to have in our gardens as well for that reason. So this first one, um, low goldenrod, likes um, dry to moist conditions, uh, full sun to semi-shade, so it's very versatile. In this case, um, stratification is recommended uh, to improve your germination. And then there's another goldenrod, stiff goldenrod. It's taller, um, but it has a lot of the same traits of the previous one and also requires stratification. And then um, sunflower, common tall sunflower. So this is our native sunflower species, um, a very tall perennial. I think it can get up to um, three meters in some cases. And also it, it's very prolific, it self seeds abundantly. But it's a great one um, for like that back fence line or against your house, the back border of your garden. It likes damp sites, um, so the wetter the better. And it's it also flowers later in the year, so it's great for for bees and other pollinators who are building up winter reserves. I I saw a fact that um, bees actually can be found sleeping in these flowers overnight, <laughs> and they're also used by wasps, flies. Butterflies, pollen eating, be pollen eating beetles, and there is one specialist bee called the sunflower leafcutter bee who relies on this species for pollination. So there you go. A great one to include in your garden. And finally, the asters. Um, so these are generally um, smaller purple flowers that look like daisies. And um, they're relatively easy to grow. They don't require stratification. Um, this first one is uh, quite small. It spreads along the ground. And um, summer, it flowers again later in the summer. The second one is taller. Um, it's showy aster. It has a lot more flowers, hence the name showy aster. Um, but it looks quite similar. And then finally, uh, this one, smooth aster. Um, is sort of, I guess, in between the other two. It's a medium size, it self seeds, and uh, it's relatively easy to grow. No stratification is required. 
Okay, just one last note. Um, if you enjoyed all of these beautiful flowers and you're wondering, okay, well, where will I get them from? So my organization has on our website what we call the Native Seed Source List. It's an Excel spreadsheet. It has a list of all the suppliers that we know of in Alberta who grow and supply um, these species. And it is really important that you, you look as close to home as possible for, for sourcing the species because then your species will be the best adapted to where you, you live, where your garden is located. Um, so if you're looking to acquire seeds or plugs, I'd recommend taking a look at this list and seeing what's nearby. Um, and I can certainly attest for some of the resources I've put here. Um, they're ones that I personally have used. So in Edmonton here, we have Arnica wildflowers and we have the Edmonton Native Plant Society who provide seeds. And then I've also gotten seeds from ALCLA Native Plants in Calgary. Um, and here are some other um, resources that I used as well. These are mostly um, books or websites that I've, I've used to put together this presentation. Okay. Awesome, thank you so much. I, I feel like I learned a lot. Um, and I'm imagining that everyone will start growing these beautiful sunflowers in their schoolyards now. I hope so. Um, <laughs> uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute now. We have about five more minutes. So if there's any questions, yeah, you can unmute or you can put them in the chat if you would prefer. I have a very small um, garden around back that I think needs needs some more flowers and things. So I'm going to look back through this presentation and see uh, what sorts of things I should should plant back there. Yeah, I have some seeds in the fridge right now <laughs> that I'm I need to get out, but they've only been in the fridge for about three weeks. So I, I'm just waiting a little bit longer. <laughs> I had no idea that you needed to put native seeds uh, in the fridge, but it makes a lot of sense now that, that you've said that, or the stratification uh, yeah. as well, to think that, of course, a lot of these seeds go through an animal's digestive system before they get uh, kind of planted, I guess, in nature. So yeah, yeah that's, that's really interesting. I had no idea about yeah. that. Um, I see one question. Um, Ashley asked, uh, my students are wondering if wild roses are a native plant species. Yes, they absolutely are. I wish I kept the slide in because I have a slide um, that talks about the fact that they are a provincial em emblem. Um, <laughs> and there are three species of wild rose in Alberta. Um, and yeah, they're oh, I wish I had a picture. Um, but yes, they are beautiful. They're my favorites. Um, pink flowers and the three species kind of um, are generally based on where they grow. So in the far south to the parkland, to the boreal. And would people be able to grow those in their gardens? You know, I, I'm i not sure. I think if you acquired them um, as, as a, a, you know, started at a greenhouse, I, you could. I'm not sure how intense the process is for starting from seed, but they are, the rosebuds are really important as a wildlife food source. So because they're generally pol or, um, eaten by animals, I would assume they require that digestive process for the seeds to grow. <laughs> Don't quote me on that, but I assume that that's what would it entail growing it from seed. But I'm sure that you can find it at garden centers because they are just lovely Alberta plants. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. Uh, are there any other questions uh, for Kristen? Yeah, it's also interesting and I think probably um, good for everyone to hear that it will take at least a year for the flowers to kind of establish themselves because I imagine if if people are planting seeds this year and then hoping to see the flowers right away, um, it might be a little bit disappointing. But if you're expecting that, yeah, it will take a little bit of time before um, those flowers will appear, then you can be prepared for that. 
Yeah, you just have to give your garden a lot of love that first season. And then once you you get past that stage, it will really take off. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, awesome. Well, if there are no further questions, I would like to say a huge thank you um, to Kristen for this great presentation. Um, and I will definitely share the recording around. So if you would like to um, share it with your classes, you are welcome to. And thank you all for, for taking the time to join us today. I know it's a, it's a bit of a crazy time, so I appreciate um, taking the time out of your schedules. Hopefully you found it as interesting as I did. So thanks very yes, much. Thank you very much, everyone. Good luck with your gardens. <laughs>